Good morning. It is January 21st, and this is the Senate Health and Welfare Committee meeting. Today, we're going to continue looking at the Task Force on Affordable Accessible Healthcare uh, information, the report that's come to us from our consultant. And we're very pleased that we have a number of folks here to help us go through that report. Um, Joshua, um, welcome. Joshua Slen of HST, Health System Transformation. And you've brought your team. Um, I, before we begin, you know, this is a continuation of uh, some of the listening uh, to the report that we did on Wednesday with House Healthcare. And as we go through this report, I think the thing that comes to mind for each of us, or at least it does for me, is how are we going to translate this into legislative action? And so as we're going through, uh, A, you know, there might be some things that we feel are important. We and we're we'd like to reach out to the federal government to help us move forward, or maybe there's something in our waivers that could be uh, adjusted, and we want to know about that, that with a you know a federal waiver. Uh, but uh, most importantly, how can we put in place some of the very uh, strong and good ideas that have come to us from, um, from the consultant report? And how can we actually move forward with those? So Joshua, I'm putting a little pressure on you uh, as we look through the, uh, the report and uh, hope that we can get uh, start start moving toward uh, legislative uh, action. So I think that's what our committee will be interested in as we're uh, listening. And so uh, did you have a thought of continuing through the slide deck at this point? Um, uh, Senator Lyons, uh, I'll, I'll take your direction clearly um, on the committee, you know, sort of where to go with the committee. There's a there's an ocean here I recognize, and although yeah. we've narrowed it down to four um, smaller bodies of water, um, uh, there's still, you know, there's a lot to talk about in each option. Um, and I, I hope that the overview the other day was good for, for the committee members. Um, we, I think, uh, want to provide uh, a little bit of depth uh, on each of the options, not too much, but a little bit of depth on each, each of the options and allow for some conversation and questions um, before we, um, so, so that we can be directed and your committee can uh, have a full understanding of what those options are. Um, uh, and, but I, I think that that was our plan for today was to, um, uh, talk a little bit about health equity because we didn't get to that, um, and then to talk uh, about each of the four options in turn, um, much like we did on the fifteenth at the at the task force on December fifteenth, but not you know not um, as many hours of that um, <laughs> uh, to start with, but to do it at a higher level to start with, and then to go into the different areas. I believe um, to your point about legislation that there's a lot of different things that could be done on the legislative front here and um, the coordination with the uh, appropriations committees and finance committees and all of that is, is, is part of the part of the conversation. Yeah, I'm sure uh, in your mind as, as you think about which ones to do when and timing and all that. So, um, and uh, I also know that there are other bills, um, which I'm not aware of, right? Um, but you may be, or Jen may be, um, and and so we're happy to participate in that conversation about you know um, how to get from here to there, from a finance perspective, from a state state uh, other departments and federal perspective, um, and uh, recognize that there's others you'll you'll need, and perhaps we can help to point out some of those if they're not obvious um, where other um, points of view and, and uh, inputs might be helpful to some of those decisions that you need to make. Um, but I think okay. the starting yeah. point is the, is, is the um, giving everyone a baseline on the options. Right, I think that that's, that's good. We have two hours um, and 
I'm, I'm hoping that within that, we'll be able to get some conversation going on this. And I think a, a note uh, for you all is that the committee members who are here were not members of the task force. So um, I was, but the other others were not. So it is important that we begin to understand the options in a little more depth. But you know, this is a this is a very um, I was going to say uh, a committee that thinks going forward, forward looking committee, and they are going to want to um, understand next steps very clearly. So um, thank you for your comments on that. But I think that is, for me, that's critically important. You know, we, we don't have the luxury of time, especially here in the Senate. The House has uh, morning and afternoon for their committee meetings, and we are efficient and utilitarian. So <laughs> there you go. Um, so so go, for... why, don't you, why don't you go ahead? Okay, thank you, Senator. For Beth and Tim, for your for your uh, information, uh, the Senate has two committees each that they're assigned to. So senators go a have a morning committee and an afternoon committee. Uh, House members have one. So that's uh, that's the Vermont. That's what uh, Senator Lyons was referring to. Um, so um, I, what we're going to do is take the same order um, and um, you know try and try and um, make this interactive. Please stop us if we're um, too high level um, and push us along if we're too, too much in the <laughs> too, too much uh, in the weeds uh, uh, to start with, and we can always go deeper. But we'll try and stay at a uh, informatively high level, um, you know, in a, in a ten minute introductions to the to the four areas as opposed to half hour convers you know of right. us talking heads on it. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it to Beth to talk about the cost growth. Um, Benchmark and Lorraine's gonna if she's able to share. Lorraine can share the the slides or or else we can if Aaron whoever can do that that would be great. All right. Well, um, while Lorraine gets us to the cost growth benchmark slides, I'll um, start by just giving. Uh, well, first let me introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. I'm Beth Waldman. Um, I'm from Baylet Health and pleased to be working um, with Joshua and the team on this. Um, and I am going to talk to you about the cost growth benchmark and affordability standards. Um, <clears throat> cost growth benchmark is, um, you probably know, is a cost containment strategy that really um, sets a limit on how much a state's healthcare spending can grow um, each year at the state, the provider, and the insurer level. Um, and um, the strategy. Um, is important because um, it, you know its outcome is really uh, intended to slow healthcare cost growth um, and align that with wage and income growth. Um, there's a number of different measures that you could choose um, to use, but the idea is by aligning it with wage or income growth, it makes it more affordable um, for um, families, for businesses, and for the state. Um, and we recognize that while doing this, it's important um, to think about um, how not to negatively impact access and um, health inequities. So we want to make sure that by making the healthcare more affordable, we're not, um, a, for example, squeezing um, providers um, on their rates so that they don't want to um, uh, be providers in Vermont. Right, so um, it's important to to think about that. Um, Vermont, as you might know, has a cost growth benchmark that's part of your all payer waiver um, at three point five percent growth, um, and not more than four point three percent growth over the five year period between twenty eighteen and twenty twenty two. So it's coming to an end because we're in twenty twenty two. Uh, and it's important to note that it is um, two things. One, it's through the waiver, and so it is only applicable to those um, uh, those residents that are um, covered sort of through the waiver um, and doesn't include all efforts because it only um, includes those people who are insured, whose data is in um, your VCURES um, data set. So it is excluding a bunch of people. 
the other thing about it is um, Can you um I'm I'm sorry to interrupt you there, but uh, it would I think important to clarify. I think we understand the different uh, cost uh, and wage income growth alignments that might take place. We did talk a little bit about some, one of those yesterday, yeah. but the um, the, the issue around VCures is something that sometimes folks forget. So we're we're not talking about including um, private insurers who don't volunteer volunteer um, their information. But can yeah. you just mention sure. that? So um, so the way uh, today you get your uh, information to measure your cost growth is through VCures, um, and that um, information is limited to um uh those to medicare medicaid um and those um uh commercially insured that uh, provide it which um uh is not everybody and so um what we see in other states that have a cost growth benchmark is actually they don't use their all-payer claims database they have a um a method where they um uh request all insurers to provide information. And so actually here, what you would do is get the information in a different way. Um, it is still voluntary for the insurers to provide it, but um, they're providing aggregated data. So they're not giving you all their claims, the things that they don't want in the APCD. Um, and what we've seen in the other states that have done this, and um, there's about 10 states that have or have have or are looking at cost growth benchmarks. And in all of the states, all of the insurers are giving um their information i see how, uh, how did that it, when you look at those other states how did it happen that they uh were able to collect all of the claims database did it require legislation which uh, from what i understand sometimes is not possible or was it voluntary um so it's um they're not getting all of the claims it's i think it's aggregated um, uh -huh. information they're sharing on expenditure. So it's so it's you don't get that same level of detail. So the insurers are more willing to give it. Um, and um, it, regarding legislation um, versus some other way, I will say that um, the states are also about half and half in how they have put a cost growth benchmark up. Um, about half of them have state legislation and half of them have done it through an executive order. Um, obviously, we're talking to a legislative committee, so um, we uh, we would recommend uh, uh, that it's legislation. It's it's um, carries on across administrations that way, and I think has more um, authority to be permanent if if there is a legislation um, that requires there be a cost growth benchmark. Um, okay, we're, and we'll have to consult with our uh, legal counsel on this because there, uh, I believe, there was a court case. Um, related so uh i will just i'm pinning that for myself to talk so do with you mean the court case about the requirement that people report to v cures yes yeah okay. so we're actually we would not recommend that that's what you do here we would recommend that there be a different way to collect the data okay. um, and if it is something that you all are interested in um we can share some detailed information about how it's done in other states but in no state are they actually using their all-payer claims database to get that information they're using separate a separate data request to the insurers okay thank you for that yep sure um and i think senator hooker it looked like you had your uh I, hand i'm up. just curious thank you thank you i'm just curious to know like what percentage of the whole population are we looking at that we're not including i mean you know how much of this information um what does it cover i guess and what doesn't it cover so i'm, I'm not um, sure i'm asking the question in a way that can be answered <laughs> so you're asking what in your current cost growth benchmark what you're including and what wouldn't be included going forward right i mean yeah. what would be included that's not today so essentially the pieces that are missing today and um joshua correct me if i'm uh wrong here but the the big piece that's missing is the commercially insured today so those big ERISA plans are not, um, they don't have any information in your VCure. So they're not as part of the current cost growth benchmark where you're getting your information through VCures, they're not included. And how big is that chunk, I guess, is, is the question I'm asking, you know, as far as total population? Um, I don't know that um, information off the top of my head. Um, Joshua or somebody else might know that. So I had it in my head uh, 
a month ago and I can't remember, so I don't want to give you the wrong number, but we'll, we can get back to you with that number. That's an, that's an, I, we know that number. I just don't know it right this second. I think it's probably in the full report. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And well, the, keep your, keep your questions, Senator, uh, make sure you, everyone is asking these questions is this is the kind of information that we need as we go forward so that we know that uh, we're covering the folk, all the folks that we need to cover uh, in our decision-making. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I think um, the um, important thing that we're suggesting here that actually um, is a step beyond what happens today, in addition to including more populations so that you have your whole state um, within the um, cost growth benchmark target, um, we're also recommending that you pair that with um, a um, process to assess emerging technologies and best practices um, with potential for a return on investment. Um, and, and by doing so, you would um, help um, further um, innovation and um, ensure that you're really looking at um, the care initiatives you're putting in place and making sure that there is a return on investment and tying that into the cost growth benchmark. So as you're, you know, if you think about um, your cost growth might be at 4.5% if you didn't do anything. Um, if you put in place some emerging technologies, for example, um, and look at um, how they are likely to save you money, you can then build that into your cost growth target out a couple of years after there has been um, time for the initiative to sort of um, uh, be implemented and, and have the ability to um, bring in some savings. And so that what you're what we're what you're inferring or implicating here is um, uh, an inv upfront investment for uh, a measurement a system of measurement so we can look at that ROI um, and and quality outcome. So there's, there's a, there's an upfront investment that needs to be made. So that's, and that, I think we talked about that the other day. Right. And the investment is twofold. It's both in sort of identifying those emerging technologies and then measuring what their return on investment might be. Okay. Can you give an example of, for, for the sake of the committee's understanding, uh, what those emerging technologies might be? Um, so we did at the, um, the uh, meeting uh, that we had with the task force on the 15th have um, with us um, a consultant who um, uh, Joshua can speak more about, um, who had a process for looking at um, technologies and um, identifying sort of where there were innovations. It could be something um, that is about sort of um, doing um, a higher level of data analytics to understanding where there's sort of gaps in care um, and um, uh, or uh, waste in the system and additional, you know, where there's too much utilization um, and sort of putting best practices in to address those things. Um, it could be some sort of mobile app that you use with folks. Uh, it could be a whole range of, um, of innovations. Uh, it could be just something that's a practice transformation that we've seen in other states to be, um, to be important. So for example, uh, one of our um, uh, later um, recommendations that we'll talk about is um, expanding the blueprint. Um, that's putting more care management in place um, to the extent that we see care management having a return on investment. Um, say it's two to one, you put in a um, million dollars, you save $2 million. Um, that's an example of something that you would then build in later to, um, to your cost growth benchmark to assess the fact um, that you would expect to have slower growth by putting that intervention in place. And so then, and in addition, uh, you know, it's, I know we always talk about ROI in terms of uh, our financial resources, but we're also, we also will have to um, analyze the quality metrics and that, and yes. you mentioned that earlier. Yep. Yes. Okay. So, and, and so I would just add to this, um, just to, as a reminder for folks from, from, was it two days ago? Um, and also 
as a reminder to all of us that the cost growth benchmarks and affordability index sit <laughs> up here, right? They sit at the top. Um, to measure overall what's going on. And the vendor or the process, the vendor and the process that we're talking about um, to include to support that would help us to measure things like the return on investment from the Blueprint for Health for very specific reasons, right? There are um, payers today, those, those uh, ERISA employers, um, you know, the that don't participate in supporting the community health teams. And a critical reason why they don't is because we can't give them a, a here's the return on investment from these teams. Here's the reason why your folks would benefit and how much you're going to save doing it. Um, and so from a population health perspective, um, this this having a vendor at this high level to support vetting ideas before they're implemented, right, to give us an, a, 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 a standardized way, not a Helter skelter way of identifying how those um, new initiatives or expansions of existing initiatives would impact our healthcare system, both for affordability for households as well as that top line, um, that top line cost growth benchmark, and then allowing for the process to happen as well for those ideas to come in, be vetted, um, and and then to be implemented through the legislative process and appropriated and then for you to have feedback you know in the next year you actually get a report then that shows on a regular basis how those things that you approved and paid for on the front end were effective in comparison to each other um, as part of the as part of the process um, the good thing that we have in vermont is we have systems and people in place um, so that doing this now is something that we believe is achievable with the right um, uh, resources within your existing um, structures. Um, and so, yes, to your point, Senator Lyons, earlier about do we need legislation? Do we need appropriations? Yes, yes. Um, we need legislation on the process, um, um, directive at least uh, on the process for doing this that we would expect to see happen, uh, right? That we, not we, HSD, we of Vermont, um, and, um, and we need appropriations to support that, right? And so those are the things that would be necessary to support the cost growth benchmark. Um, and um, Beth, not to sort of steal your thunder here, but right. um, in addition to the, in addition to, you know, su supporting this with a population health vendor, um, there would also need need to be some resources, human resources at the GMCB, if that was where this was located, to to manage the to manage all of this. Right. You now, all those things come to mind as uh, you and Beth are talking. So, why don't we why don't we keep going? Otherwise, we're going to be here all day. <laughs> but thank you, thank you. That that's very good. Uh, Senator sure. Hardy, and and listen, committee. If you have a question, you're going to have to speak up. I can see Senator Hardy, so she's lucky. <laughs> but go ahead, Senator. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I, I don't see in this proposal anything about quality of care, patients, and outcomes. Um, it, it seems to be all about saving money, which I'm all for saving money, but ultimately our healthcare system is supposed to be about taking care of people. Um, so that seems drastically absent from anything in this proposal. Um, I also wonder, um, uh, it, I, I'm actually happy to see that you don't mention the ACO in here at all, and that it doesn't seem like we need the ACO at all, that we could be doing this with the Green Mountain Care Board and get rid of the expensive and ineffective accountable care organization that we have that has not been able to implement this cost growth strategy very effectively. And in fact, have not met the current benchmarks that we have. So is that what you're proposing that we could do this all through the Green Mountain Care Board and not even bother with our ineffective ACO? So I can't comment about the ACO. I'm not close enough to it, Senator Hardy, to, to say whether or not I think it's working. Um, but what I will say is that this is, um, you could you could do this cost growth um, strategy with the ACO. What this is, is additive on top of it. 
um, so that there is a cost growth benchmark that covers the whole state um, and not just the ACO piece of it. Um, and the second thing is um, this this um, is um, an overall, as Joshua said, umbrella strategy that gets people thinking about cost growth. Um, and um, as uh, as we're thinking about the emerging technologies and the best practices um, that are looking at reducing um, spending, they also, um, as we've mentioned, are looking at the quality outcomes that are part of it. That would be sort of wrapped into it. But you're right that the sort of overall standard is how can we keep the cost growth at a, a limit? There are other strategies sort of underneath this um, that would focus on the outcomes um, and the measures. Um, one thing we haven't talked about um, is the um, affordability standard. So the cost growth benchmark will keep the um, overall um, growth rate lower, but it doesn't necessarily translate to the individuals. And I think that's a little bit what you're getting at. There is also um, the potential to put affordability standards in place um, that, um, that measure how much, uh, what is the appropriate amount an individual should pay um, in premiums, and that you do some of today. Um, but in most cases where there's affordability standards, you're just looking at the premiums and not the out-of-pocket costs. Um, and doing those things together, a cost growth benchmark plus an affordability standard would give you sort of the ability to look at not just how cost how, how cost is growing, uh, healthcare costs are growing across the board and keeping those at a lower level, but um, ensuring that some of that um, reduction in growth is also supporting the consumer. Well, I appreciate that you that you are linking it to the the cost for the the individual person, or as you say, consumer. But I guess I would like to flip it on the head on its head and say that the the first thing we should talk about the overall umbrella of our healthcare system should be about taking care of people. Sure. And, and the quality of care and access to that care that people get. And then below that, underneath it, we can have quality, uh, we can have benchmarks and affordability standards to make sure that our system is not too expensive. But we need to talk first about the quality of care. And there's so much we could do in Vermont to improve that quality of care. And we could use some of these emerging technologies to improve care first and foremost. And I guess I'm I'm a little disappointed that your approach starts first with this overarching philosophy of saving money rather than taking care of people. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step back to the conversation that we had about V cures and claims data and the use of that in quality metric analysis as well as. Um, and, and we aren't having a discussion about ACO um, at this time, but the ACO does have a, a system for quality metric analysis to improve clinical care and patient outcomes. So the question is, you know, is that what that group is doing? Is that affordable? And is it the right metric? Is it the right clinical um, improvement or set of data? So I think as we move forward, we're going to hear more uh, about that. And the, the issue of quality is so important to us. <laughs> you know, this committee has talked about that many times, and, but we're also interested in making whatever we do, whatever is accessible to also making it affordable. So let's, uh, you know, these are good questions and we're going to have to, um, struggle with those a little bit. So uh, we'll move, why don't we, why don't we keep moving along, but pin those questions are very important. Okay, um, maybe the rain, we can go to the next slide. I don't, I don't think we need to go into all of the detail um, uh, um, in terms of um, how you could determine your cost growth um, target methodology. Um, uh, set the value for that, what the, what the actual growth level is, um, and then um, uh, assess whether or not you're uh, uh, performing relative to that, that target. So I think we can um, move on to the next slide unless there's other questions 
um, about the sort of process. That's all sort of detailed um, in the uh, report you have. Um, likewise, there's um, there is um, authority um, and governance uh, examples um, and questions for you to consider as you're um, putting together cost growth standard. Um, and I think here the initiatives to support efforts to reduce cost growth. Um, uh, this, I think, Senator Hardy um, talks uh, a little bit to your question around quality because it is essential that we make sure that um, as we're reducing costs, um, we're not um, harming quality in any way and in fact improving it because um, if you don't improve quality as you go, then you're actually likely to end up with a higher cost growth. So um, the two are um, inextricably linked. Um, and then finally, the implementation uh, strategies, which include legislations um, uh, modifying um, the existing strategy at the Green Mountain Care Board, uh, requesting the data submission from the plans, um, as, uh, as I suggested, um, and then sort of having an ongoing um, uh, review, um, publishing the performance, um, and being really clear um, I think this is um, uh, a really important piece of the uh, negotiation um, that would happen between the insurers and the um, providers um, and showing sort of where insurers are growing more than your cost growth if they are um, is really important to help sort of keep it in check. Um, and so, um, so this is a really important piece of the implementation strategy. So there's a lot, there's a huge number of implications. <laughs> And been this, uh, I mean, for the current regulatory system that we have, but also with the agreements between insurers and providers. So we have a lot of questions to ask, and maybe some changes to be made. Um, if you know, should we go through with this one? You know, for example, we have no clue what the contract arrangements are, so that doesn't give us a picture or a window into. Um, rates uh, uh, at for individual providers and or reimbursement so um there's a lot here it goes right down to the bottom line yes right and there are also implications for quality because we don't have a clue as to the uh, grievance period allowed for patients or network and, and out of network issues uh for patients so there are a whole lot of embedded questions as we go forward with this. And there's some things that I have been thinking about for a long time on this. And I, I don't know what, I don't know what the appetite will be for legislation to improve some of this and increase transparency, but it's an absolutely a discussion we'll have to have. And we haven't brought up um, the division between DFR and Green Mountain Care Board and their uh, roles and responsibility related to rates and private insurers. So there's a whole bunch built in to this. Yeah, and I would say, you know, in other states that um, that have um, uh, cost growth um, benchmarks, typically the, not always, but typically the um, a agency or um, government uh, organization that's responsible for the cost growth benchmark um, is not necessarily the one that is setting the rates, that they're a separate um, separate entity. And so I think that sort of fits um, with the structure you have between um, uh, the two departments. And so, um, so I think there's some good examples for you to look at um, and that are described in the uh, report. Um, Lorraine, do you wanna to go to the next slide? Um, so um, here's uh, um, the uh, legislative options. Again, we would suggest that this happen through the Green Mountain Care Board, um, and you could um, amend their statute to allow um, them this authority um, and um, strengthen um, some of the language that's currently in there um, to require, um, uh, to give them some more authority um, around setting a benchmark. Um, and as Joshua uh, noted, there'd be the need for some additional resources um, to support them in doing this work. Um, any questions there? Okay. 
Next slide. Okay, so that's th that would move us on to the next topic. So um, before we do move on, are there any other uh, questions about cost growth at this point? Yes, uh, I'll just go back to the to the previous slide if we could, and and sure. let, let's hold it there for a minute so that folks may have questions or comments. Um, but we do, and we do want to move on. No question about that. But so Green Mountain Care Board establishing, let's suppose that they would establish uh, the cost growth benchmark. Then um, we also know that currently claims there's a claims database within the Green Mountain Care Board. And we also know that the Green Mountain Care Board is responsible for the health resource allocation plan. So we're seeing a lot of authority with that one uh, regulatory body. Then the question arises about the quality outcome measurements and where that belongs. So is there, do you have some thought on that? I know that the, we've been looking at that for a long time, but currently it is sort of in the Green Mountain Care Board, but sort of not. So what, what is the thinking on that and what do we see in other states? So again, in other states, you know, I, I am uh, most familiar with Massachusetts where I am um, and we have the Health Policy Commission, which is responsible for um, the cost growth benchmark, but it is also responsible um, for looking sort of overall um, at um, the uh, uh, quality of care being um, provided in the state. And so I think that they have sort of joint um, reporting where they have both sort of this cost growth benchmark, but then they look to see um, how the state as a whole is um, performing against quality measures and um, and they rely on um, a separate agency in Massachusetts that um, is um, actually it's both the rate setting agency um, as well as um, the uh, place where the all payer claims database sits. Um, but then they also do a number of performance measures based on um, based on the sort of claims they have. And so um, I would have to go back and check to see, you know, because in, in Massachusetts, I don't think in the APCD, they have all of the um, external data either, the voluntary data from the insurers, um, but they do measure sort of quality across the board in Massachusetts. And so I'd, I would have to just confirm whether or not the, um, the, the sort of um, commercial payer uh, results are in are part of that, but each of the insurers um, have their own sort of um, are are reporting on their own results uh, relative to heat as quality measures, um, and so I think there are things you can look at even if it's not part um, of the um, the overall um, review and uh, reporting. Um, and and Beth, let me just add here that sure. there um, also are states. Um, like Maryland that report um, uh, star ratings on their, you know, and, and post them um, on their MCOs. Um, and uh, that's done in some instances, uh, you know, for the Medicaid MCOs of which we don't have any, right? Um, or um, on the commercial separately, right? Um, and uh, in Vermont, that, um, that, that type of process could be uh, applied as well um, to provide some level of um, quality um, direct from a transparency perspective to report quality to consumers. Um, the baseline, just so like, I just want to set the baseline for this, all of our quality, when we build up, whether it's NCQA or, you know, another regulatory authority um, or, or, or not-for-profit or whatever it is, all the data comes from the same place. So I want us to understand that, that um, there's uh, requirements for HEDIS data to be collected. There are um, a, a ton of sort of wormholes to go down on HEDIS data where um, it, 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 it um, conflates, you can easily conflate different issues, but it's what we have, so it's what we use. Um, but when you roll up to those star ratings or point ratings um, in different states on quality and consumer satisfaction, you're always using CAPS, you're always using the consumer survey. Um, 
um, on the on the public payer side, um, and you're always using HEDIS data on the quality metric side. Um, there are other state-based metrics, and and we could do some of our own. At the very least, I would advise us against starting in that place, which is not let's not create our own data measures that are one off from the national measures and the HEDIS measures that we're already using. But this you, whole, uh, you know, before you go, could you please um, uh, spell out the acronym for HEDIS? What, what is that exactly? What does HEDIS stand for? Health, yes, health, please. It, health. Well, I think it's not actually a, I think now it's just a term, but it is like <laughs> health, um, health. I just uh, looked it up if that's helpful. This is Jen yeah. Carby. Go it's again. the healthcare effectiveness data and information set, yeah. according to NCQA's website. None of us will remember that. Now we got heat us, but so <laughs> it's a, it's a, can you explain exactly what it is for us? Sure. Um, it is uh, the collection of specific health um, information, um, very specific, like, so what your uh, hemoglobin A1C is for individuals. Um, and it, and it runs across lots of different clinical areas. Um, and so there's lots and lots and lots of HEDIS measures that then get rolled up into how are you performing on making sure people get their diabetes managed or get um, their heart condition managed um, and then roll up to sort of get combined at the at the rating level, when, when Maryland's doing a score with a star rating for a health plan, they're rolling up all of a whole bunch of different HEDIS measures and a whole bunch of different consumer survey information and then giving them a rating, right? Um, and uh, so you can see that's a big process, right? Um, right, well, but here's the thing, and I, I, wanna, I wanna move on because we'll, we can get into this further at, as time goes on. But the, it seems to me it links nicely with what we're doing in Blueprint. And I, but I, that's, I'll just say it, if you shake your head, no, then that's fine. But I do believe that, that, yes. is, that this, there's a link here that can be made in terms of quality of uh, assessment and information. With and, the and, and, and senators, I would, I would say that um, diving in separately to the quality issue um, from a statewide reporting and fitting it into the Vermont um, uh, ecosystem is something that deserves its own significant amount of attention, right? Um, in order to do it well at a statewide, if you wanted to go to a sort of a star rating for either providers or um, uh, health systems or uh, MCOs, ACOs, um, that um, that, that that's its, its own whole own thing. What we did envision here, though, is that when you do an ROI investment, that includes the the outcomes, right? You can't have um, worse outcomes. There's no reason to do something that's going to produce worse outcomes. Um, and so, um, when we evaluate as part of the process for evaluating, and when we get and really get into this, when you talk about the other three initiatives here. So when we start talking about the other three initiatives, the options, those options each could be evaluated. And first and foremost, on who they affect and how they affect them, right? That's how the task force talked about all this stuff is who does it affect? How does it affect them? It, it does it make um, it more affordable for them? Do they have more accessibility um, because of the initiatives? Um, and um, in order to do any of these initiatives, they have to have outcomes that are beneficial to the individuals. Um, so, okay, this is good, and uh, thank you for reiterating that because that was a that was a that's a huge part of the task force uh, interest in going forward. If you don't have beneficial outcomes for affordability, accessibility, and um, health at the end of the at the end of the time then don't do it. Uh, we mm -hmm. really want to keep money in people's pockets and we want to keep them as healthy as possible. So I think we should move on unless there are other questions on this one. Okay. Okay. So um, from a baseline perspective, um, uh, I, I'm going to, again, push me 
up or down here from a how too much information, too much talking on something and not enough on something else. Um, we currently have in Vermont uh, a waiver, right? So we have home and community-based services in Vermont and we've long, long, many decades now um, been moving people to and or organizing our clinical and care systems at the community level to make sure that people can age in place, um, that um, disabled adults can be served in their home in settings that they prefer. Um, overwhelmingly, folks prefer um, to be served at home, no surprise, right? Um, and it actually costs us on average less, um, although some individuals cost more to serve at home, and on average, it costs us less to serve folks at home um, that need help with their uh, activities of daily living. So we have this program today. Um, the moderate needs group is a, technically it's a waiver, right? So the federal, so the Medicaid program um, can't do things that aren't in their state plan um, with that agreement with the federal government without getting, without getting a waiver to do those things. Um, and so we have a waiver. Um, that waiver's likely to stay in place. It's been in place for a long time and likely to continue to stay in place. Uh, both the Trump and Biden administrations are supportive of HCBS um, uh, and have continued, it's continued to grow just not in, Ver not just in Vermont, but across the country. Every country, every state has multiple home and community-based services waivers, um, supporting different populations with different sets of services in different geographies and with different delivery methods. So Vermont has ours and it's not going away. Uh, and um, we serve right now about a thousand Vermonters at any, at any point in time on the moderate needs group, in the moderate needs group. These are folks that don't need as much assistance as other folks, um, but that need some help with activities of daily living. And um, that's limited by how much money is in there uh, right now. And there is a waiting list for folks to um, get in. That waiting list to get into the weeds just a teeny bit is not held at the state level today. It's held at the community level. And they don't, they don't um, um, update that list um, in, a, in a fixed way so that the state isn't updating it in a fixed way. So when we say there's 300 to 700 people on it, that's a point in time where the, you know, where we say there's 700 people on it or 500 when you hear those numbers, those are point in time where you've asked Dale and the Department for Aging and Independent Living has gone and asked the community, how many people do you have waiting for these services? Um, and that immediately changes, right? So, so that's um, that process. I just wanted us to have a view into how that process works today. Um, Cause I think it, it's important to understand that cause you'll get different numbers. Um, on who's on the waiting list for the current program. The concept here is to say, again, just at a high level, um, once you hit 65, you're gonna, 70% of us are gonna need assistance with activity as of daily living uh, at some point in our lives. Once you turn 65, the chances are, you know, if there's three of us sitting there, that two of us are gonna need assistance with activities of daily living. And um, our insurer is not gonna cover that. Um, so our commercial insurance is not going to cover your uh, home health aid to come into your house and help you uh, take a bath or, um, uh, or other things. Um, and they will cover your, your, you know, your acute uh, visit to the hospital because you fell, right? Um, the, but, they, but they're not covering those, those activities of daily living in the house, by and large, um, in your commercial policies. Um, and so Medicaid today... Um, is the insurer that people end up um, going to to get their um, long-term care needs served, right? Um, those activities of daily living served and people end up spending down to Medicaid, right? So the reason we have the moderate needs group is because it helps people avoid spending down. You don't have to spend down your assets, sell your family camp or get rid of your second car or whatever else in order to access the moderate needs group um, because we don't have an asset test in the moderate needs group. Um, so the idea here writ large is to say Medicaid has become from a de facto perspective the long-term services and supports area, the area that supports individuals regardless of income unless you're a millionaire. Um, um, if you end up needing lots of care, met, you're going to end up 
selling your stuff and becoming eligible for Medicaid. So how do we do two things here? How do we help people um, uh, not have to get rid of their lifetime's worth of stuff, right? If at, at, a, at certain levels, right? Um, so not folks that have tons and tons of stuff and can pay for cash for this, but folks that are just above Medicaid today and end up having to spend right down into it and sell their last thing um, in order to do it. Um, that the moderate needs group has been focused on that, which is helping those activities of daily living um, for that for, for, for folks that are just over. This proposal is to say, you know, we should do two things here. We should expand what we can do to support family caregivers um, so that more individuals can be served because right now there's workforce issues and lots of those types of things. And two, we should expand the number of individuals that we provide this access to. And we should do that because um, it, it will um, reduce the number of individuals um, on an annual basis that have to seek higher level, more expensive care placements. Um, and so providing a small amount of service um, will reduce over time the number of people that have to spend down to Medicaid um, and the number of individuals who um, uh, end up um, you know, in the hospital um, or in a nursing facility at much higher cost. So those things are measurable, right? We can we can do an we can do a how much how much does this help someone? How valuable is it to you as an individual to not have to go to a nursing home, to not have to go into a hospital, right, Senator? Yes, and while you're um, going into this, we understand that we're getting it very well. Um, I guess the question is, at what point is there something? that we can do um, to connect with the federal government to increase um, access to moderate needs coverage. Yep. Um, okay. uh, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, so just pointing out here um, that there's uh, other states that have done this and connected with the, that uh, have done similar things to what we're proposing. It would be slightly different in Vermont and every state's a little different about how our program's designed today and what we would do at, at what, what the benefit level would be. I wanna point out that um, we can target what that benefit level would be so you can control how much you're gonna spend, how much you're gonna provide to people. Um, I think that when, uh, when you have the Department for Aging and Independent Living in to, to talk about this, that they'll talk about using a flexible benefit, so a cash benefit that people could use to train caregivers or to do different things. Um, and in addition, and directly to your question, Senator Lyons, um, we believe and have a very high level of confidence that the federal government will participate in this program um, the same way they do in our current program by paying their portion of it to the extent that we can um, demonstrate that there are savings to the federal government overall. And there are savings here to, um, to Medicare and to Medicaid for individuals who don't spend down to Medicaid and for individuals who are on Medicare who do not end up um, needing nursing facility um, uh, level of support for some period of time. So, so there will be a waiver. So to, directly to your question, <laughs> um, you, there will be a, a waiver amendment. Um, and we believe that that is an easy yes from the federal government and needs to be teed up um, and supported with a one-time appropriation to do the necessary analysis and make the case um, for that. Um, for that. Is that a um, 1332 waiver? What, which waiver is that? Um, in Vermont, it's underneath the 1115, so it used to be okay. in the 1915 area, but today it's all under the 1115. Okay. So it's a matter, uh, I mean, it, it seems like there are several things that need to happen here legislatively, some of them at the state level, but then uh, asking to have this negotiated uh, waiver. Yeah, there would need to be an and, appropriation, some additional right. authorizing legislation, right. and right. a waiver. Right. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Yes. Oh, go ahead, Senator. Thank you. Um, well, this one I actually like because <laughs> this one is actually about providing 
better care for patients. So thank you. This one should have been first. Um, and uh, I, but um, you know we have a bill. I think it's H one fifty three that is about trying to uh, figure out how much more resources we need to provide to home and community health care uh, providers in order for them to keep doing just what they're currently doing mm -hmm. um, because the system is, as you know, so incredibly stressed and there are workforce issues, et cetera, et cetera. So my question is how do we support what we're already doing and um, expand what we should be doing to more people in this group? Yeah, that's a great question. And the task force explicitly discussed it. So we have, I can speak to it because the, the task force Excellent. spoke about it at, at length. Um, so I'm, I'm sure you're aware of the workforce issues and of the workforce that work that's going on on the workforce. Um, we at the task force level um, had a number of discussions about that and there was a decision made to let the workforce issues be dealt with you know, in another place. And so I don't, I'm not punting it here. I'll tell you that there are workforce issues that the Department for Aging and Independent Living will say that we can't fill all of our care hours today. And I'll tell you that nationally, we're only filling 70% of the care hours for everybody on HCBS waivers nationally. And that all has to do with workforce, either wages or, or availability of willing souls to do it, right? Um, some combination of those things. So we believe that um, expanding the family caregiver supports um, and aggressively working with um, our families in Vermont to um, to support them, so that the, so that our fam so that your family can provide these services with supports that they don't have today, um, can allow for an expansion here that otherwise wouldn't be viable in the short term, given the workforce issues. Okay, so just let me make sure I'm clear about this. So. I have a constituent who I've spoken with a lot recently who is caring for her mother who has Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and she is so she's caring for her mom she herself is a mom trying to balance working her own job and taking care of her own kids and she basically gets no money to help support her in her all the hours she puts toward caring for her mother so would this proposal provide Fund and so she's not even included in this workforce, right? She's just a daughter doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. So would she be able to access actual money to help pay her to take care of her mother? Is that what you're proposing? The so we've so I'm again not going to punt, but bef I'm going to qualify before I give you my direct answer, and that is that we tried very hard not to design the programs for. Um, the administration here, right? Um, however, um, now I'm going to answer the question directly for you, which Thank is you. yes, yes. Um, the individual, that's exactly the type of individual um, at a high level here without getting into the eligibility detail, details of course, yes. um, that, um, that would receive payment to, to for the hours that they're providing or for some portion of the hours that they're providing depending on funding and eligibility and all of those issues, yes. Okay, great, thank you. And, and then um, I think we, we need to continue to reiterate the importance of um, the data collection and clinical data collection that uh, are, included in the the benchmark the growth benchmark i understand that uh senator hardy you're very concerned about it's not being mentioned but it is integral very integral to uh that initial cap on expenditures and so we'll have to talk further about that so we can appreciate what's in the first one because i think it for me these all link together in some way so i'll we'll have to sort all this out um Yep. Can we go to the next slide? I think we've talked through these items. These are the high level items I've been um, been hitting on. So the next slide, please. Um, so just uh, just wanted to um, target for you 
um, very briefly sort of what we're talking about from a dollar's perspective. Um, the current moderate needs group, um, that's the folks on your waiver today, um, uh, this is this is their spending, right? So um, there's an out of pocket of about 200 and on these services. So on the the things that that we're talking about here, not on everything that they spend money in the healthcare system on. Um, and about 1600 that's um, paid, you know, by an insurer. So we are talking about a, a small piece, but it becomes significant. Um, this is a monthly number, so it becomes significant when you add it up and you think about income levels for different folks and, and the fact that there's lost wages involved. Um, next slide, please. Um, just wanted to point out here very briefly that there, there are folks that are below 65, right? But predominantly, we are talking about folks um, that um, currently on the moderate needs group are over 65. Interestingly, when we look at the potential beneficiaries, so we mined the, the database here in Vermont, we looked at all of the individuals who might be eligible um, based on their clinical diagnoses um, um, and their care patterns in the past. There are individuals in the 45 to 64 year age group um, that are not you know, eligible today and not being seen by the system today that are almost certainly eligible at a higher percentage than are represented in our moderate needs group today. And so um, that's not, this surpri that shouldn't be surprising to any of us because um, fo the folks to the right from an age perspective, um, there's a higher percentage of the population that has a need. And, and so that's who we're capturing today naturally. Um, and it'll take a little outreach to capture some of the other folks who need but are not on a disabled waiver today because they don't need that level of care, but they do need some assistance. Um, and that cohort, that 45 to 64 cohort, is also likely to be a place where we have um, significant savings to demonstrate to Medicaid and Medicare on the waiver front when we're asking for federal funding. Um, so that's that's exactly exactly what would happen here is is you would we would hire Dale would probably hire a vendor right for a couple hundred thousand dollars to do an analysis that would that would could be put into a waiver application and delivered to the federal government that says here's the people we're going to serve we did the analysis of Vermont they would take our analysis and go further than we've gone um, in order to. Um, make the waiver submission the way they need to um, and would say, and here's the folks we believe we will find. Um, and here's our plan for measuring that to show you the federal government that we actually are saving you money. So you'll help pay for all of this. Um, that's the, how that will work. Who does Next. that analysis? Um, so the analysis would be done by, um, it could be done in-house, but it almost certainly, uh, and again, not to speak for the department, almost certainly they'll hire someone to do it. Um, yeah. And there's lots of firms that do this and, and whether you require an actuary or not is something to talk about. You could do it with an actuary. Um, you could do it um, with uh, just a data, a data firm that really you know, does this a lot and specifically in this area. Um, and we can help with some of those names, but, but Dale, uh, almost, I suspect they have someone on contract um, that, could do, that could do this for them. A milliman, for example, could do this, right? Right, okay. Are you there? Joshua, you're frozen. Yeah. Are you frozen? No, go. Uh, no, no, no. I thought okay. Senator Hooker was going to ask a question, so I was paused. I, I am, um, if I could. Are the people, you, you talked about waiting lists. Are these people in these lower age groups part of that waiting list? Where are these people now that you're looking at? Um, mm -hmm. they, you know, they could be, but the vast majority of them are not um, on a waiting list at all right now. They are just individuals that we have identified as having the same uh, clinical conditions and patterns of utilization within the system 
as the folks that are on the moderate needs group today. And so therefore we know that they have the same level of care needs um, and how they're getting their care needs met might be from a relative, um, might be that they're higher income and paying cash out of pocket. Um, they may not be even aware of the moderate needs group um, in some instances. Um, uh, and uh, so those are all um, possibilities. Yeah, Senator Hooker, just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but the example that I gave earlier about the, my constituent is exactly that. Her mother, it's early onset Alzheimer's. Her mom is like 53 or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, and she's not getting any support, you know, financial support to do what she's doing. So this is exactly, this is why I like this one. Well, I like it as well. I also have a constituent <laughs> who's taking care of her partner and not getting any compensation for it. So. Uh, this this absolutely resonates with people, and and the, and it's it's so important. So, okay, um, keep, keep. Yep. Going. Next slide. So here's the here's the big here's the big sort of I'm going to caveat this with. Um, these are the most aggressive numbers, so the highest numbers that you could possibly see um, uh, when we think about this. Um, and, and we did that on purpose because we wanted to uh, you not, not underestimate um, and have a surprise on the other side. And I think that the way you manage this, um, quite frankly, is to the dollars that you have available in the end, um, uh, because that's, that, there's, there's a, if you, if you open the door, um, it, it'll go wherever it goes. Right. So, but that, that's how almost, that's how every state manages this, um, that I'm aware of, which is, um, there's a wait list once we hit our dollars and that's what we have in place today for that first line here, those 500 to 700 folks, um, that would, that, that could come in, um, right away. Um, and let's be clear that these folks are not static. When we're talking about folks, they're actually equivalent to an, an individual year for a year, right? It's not, it's not that Josh necessarily, some folks need ongoing so that early onset Alzheimer's will need ongoing and ongoing. But a lot of folks need three months and six months. And it, there was an event of some sort of stroke that you recover from and then you don't need anything for three or five more years right and, and and maybe you need something more then and so these individuals both the thousand that are on the mng the moderate needs group today and any additionals that we would add um they they're very there's all kinds of folks in there right and so it's 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 parts of josh and parts of beth and parts of tim not not um not Josh all the time. In some cases it is, you know, a Josh or a Tim all the time for the full year, um, but in other cases it's not. Um, we then broke out Medicare folks, right? So here's our either disabled Medicare folks, but primarily above 65 Medicare folks. So eligible by age, um, not by um, getting onto SSI and SSDI. Um, and, um, and then there's the commercially insured folks. The commercially insured folks are a smaller group, um, uh, but it's a it's a totally unrepresented group in our pantheon today um, of folks that we really target with programs. Um, and they're they're folks that I would just point out um, uh, that end up in one of those other two groups when we ignore their ADL needs <laughs> today. Um, and so uh, we get them one way or another. Um, and the argument here is that um, it's one you know well, right? Which is that getting upstream on this and providing a little bit of support um, can uh, miss some of the more expensive things later on. Um, next slide, please. This we talked about already, which is in order to add it to the global waiver to the 1115 that we have in place, we need to do a little financial analysis. And I think that's the last one. Is there another one? No. For, no. Okay. So that's where we are in moderate needs. So the total number of people affected can be up to 18,000. Right. So, and if there were, um, so, so what we did, what we didn't look at was 
uh, how many Vermonters would be affected by a cap on co uh, cost? Uh, by a cap on how much we gave each Vermonter or on yeah, the Yeah, the total. Yeah, Number. so if we can go back to that dollar slide for a second. Yeah, um, no, the next one, yeah. So down one more, that one. Very good, thank you. Um, so, so if we, if we, so let me just talk a little bit about this. Um, let's use the Medicare number. That's the biggest, scariest number on the page, right? Um, because there's the most people, right? Above 65 in Vermont is 140 plus thousand individuals. Um, of those individuals, um, there are uh, 14,715 who are not on, um, are, are not in our moderate needs group today um, and not known to our, um, not known to our uh, uh, Department of Aging and Independent Living today because they haven't come in through an eligibility door, right? Um, who have the same clinical characteristics as individuals who have come in through the, through the eligibility door. Um, some of them are, are higher income, right? Um, and one of the ways to manage that $20 million down to five very quickly is to set an income cap um, uh, on there, right? Um, and uh, currently the MNG, the moderate needs group cutoff is that $2,523 per, per month per person. So um, the analysis, um, uh, we do break down by income level in the paper, how many people there are in each category. And we have the dollar amount per person on average that it costs today. Um, you could provide a, a slimmer benefit than there is today. So a smaller dollar amount per individual um, that would provide some benefit to a broader group of people. Um, you could provide the same level of benefit that's provided today um, to a smaller group of people, right? That, that's the playoff there uh, with, on the dollars front. Um, yeah. I think we're good, we get it. Does I that think, help? Yeah, yeah no. Um, I, I actually asked a different question, so I'll ask it another time because I oh. think we probably should move forward. I apologize. No, nope, that's not a problem. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Tim for pub public option. Great. Um, so happy to be here this morning. I'll kind of go through these at a high level just to kind of set the stage here. Now we're <clears throat> kind of talking about a different set of proposals and a different attack on accessibility and affordability if the cost growth curve was about overall aggregate spending and restraining costs and the moderate needs was about direct service delivery and, and um, finding ways at a very micro level to be sure we're delivering services. This is about creating more coverage options, coverage options in terms of insurance coverage options uh, for Vermonters that might be more affordable um, than what they're um, facing now. And in particular, and we'll talk more about this, folks who are in the individual and small group market. So a little different part of the, um, of the economy here, but that's kind of what we're talking about. And so just to kind of back up, a public option, as I said, really is an insurance coverage option, you know, designed to leverage the state's position as a payer and a regulator uh, to create something that might be more affordable than otherwise would have been available to Vermonters, um, either through the commercial marketplace or on the exchange. Typically, when I say typically, because much of this is conceptual, when people think about a public option, there's three ways to deliver it, right? Um, you can create a new public program, like a new Medicaid um, or a new um, state employees program, something analogous to this to actually go out and compete in the market, try and uh, get people to enroll. Um, you could leverage existing private plans or Medicaid plans uh, to administer uh, benefits, sort of a public-private partnership uh, overseen by the state. Or you can expand an existing state program, right? Open up the employee um, health, the state employee health system or uh, the retiree system or Medicaid to folks who otherwise wouldn't be eligible and leverage that delivery system to provide care. Um, long and the short, every state that has considered this and kind of moved forward and there are 
I would say I would characterize it as two and a half states have done the second option, which is public private option where you're leveraging uh, existing networks and uh, insurers um, to deliver public option services. So that's kind of at a high level, kind of what a public option is and kind of what um, what the delivery mechanisms might be. So if you could go to the next slide. So who will it affect uh, for Vermont if we were going to do something like this? When you talk about consumers, as I said, uh, this is largely a small group and individual um, market uh, combined kind of thing, right? This is who it's going to affect mostly. There's 69,000 people uh, in those markets. Um, there's an, an additional, you know, almost 4% of Vermonters who are uninsured. So, you know, that's a significant chunk of folks who could potentially take advantage of it. Now I recognize, you know, that 3% number on uninsured is a pretty, um, you know, pretty big number. I don't know that we're gonna move that too much with a public option given churn and whatnot, but the Vermonters in the small group market uh, and the individual market, I think, um, you know, that's a place where it can help, right? And if you think about what other states have done in terms of the savings that they've targeted um, for people who are implementing a public option, um, we could be talking about, you know, if you think about a, a silver plan premium, uh, as much as $1,300 a year that you could save an individual in one of those two markets by, depending upon how you implemented a public option. Um, insurers obviously are another large stakeholder here. Um, obviously, they're never going to be on board with a, a state-run, government-run program in direct competition with them. Uh, but clearly, if there's a public-private partnership where they are being leveraged in Vermont, it's really two uh, commercial plans that are being leveraged to deliver services, I think, uh, that they're likely to work with the state to understand how that's going to work. And then providers are the other big stakeholder here, right? Because, and we're going to talk about this on the next slide, um, they're the folks actually delivering care. They're the ones who are ultimately getting paid for care. <clears throat> and depending upon how the save, how any savings are derived in a public option, um, it is their ox that, that might end up being gored. And so they're going to have a, a say and they're going to worry a little bit about how that all gets structured. Uh, so why don't we move on to the next slide? So before we move on to some of the real kind of nitty gritty implementation considerations, let me stop here and talk a little bit about how do you pay for it, right? There's a lot of other um, policy levers, um, but overriding everything is, you know, how do you, how do you make it work from a financial standpoint? Because at the end of the day, to make a public option work, it's got the, the coverage option itself has to be Kind of more affordable than what they than what a consumer or a small uh, employer could direct their employees to on the marketplace now. Uh, and there's a couple of ways you can get there, right? You can in sort of per my prior slide, you can reduce or hold provider rates to a level, right? You can benchmark them against commercial rates. You can benchmark them against Medicare rates, um, but try and use Medicare rate provider, excuse me, provider rate reductions as a way to drive um, premium reductions that then might be uh, creating an option that's more attractive to consumers. Of course, depending upon how those are structured, you're gonna, you're gonna get provider resistance, right? To the extent that they're baselined on commercial rates, probably less so, um, the, more, the more you think about baseline against Medicare or Medicaid rates, um, probably more uh, resistance to provide from providers on that standpoint. But, but again, limit provider rates, that's going to turn into premium savings. The second option or a second conceptual source of savings, if you will, is competition, right? Just establish by establishing the benefits by establishing provider networks, by creating competition amongst insurers, you can drive premiums, right? That's the theory of the marketplace now is if you get standard benefits, a standard um, set of plans and you get plans to compete, you're gonna drive rates down relative to what they might otherwise be. 
from my perspective, that's a pretty conceptual argument, particularly for a state like Vermont, where there's pretty limited commercial engagement of insurers. I don't know that competition alone is going to drive premium to a place where you're going to get savings or at least measurable savings that you can articulate. And I'm going to tell you in a minute why it's important that you have to be able to articulate those savings. Um, so it, it, it is it is an outcome you want to achieve. I'm not sure it's an outcome or a, a, something you need to hang your hat on to say, yeah, you're really going to get savings here. Um, the third source, um, obviously, is you can you can appropriate money. You can put state dollars and subsidize um, premiums or subsidize the plans to such a degree uh, that they look more attractive to what uh, consumers otherwise might, otherwise might see. And I, I don't need to tell you the implications of what that means and sort of how you get those state dollars it becomes complicated. The financing considerations are important um, because you, another source is federal dollars, right? You need, you can, if you generate savings in a public option uh, and you generate savings in such a way that what the federal government might otherwise spend on premium tax credit subsidies for people who are in the marketplace, right? If you drive premiums down enough that the, the federal subsidies go down, you can submit a demonstration waiver to the federal government and be able to recoup some of those costs, right? So if we're able to put together a package, if you're able to, to show in an actuarial way to the federal government this, this um, public option scheme that we, and I don't say scheme in a bad way, this public option program that we put together uh, is going to reduce premiums across the board um, for beneficiaries who are going into it. And then subsequently, they're going to reduce the, the amount of money that the federal government has to pay for those folks who are otherwise subsidy eligible, you get to get some of that money back. Um, states that have proposed that, some states have proposed to take that money uh, and put it back into the public option. You could take that money, um, as some states, Nevada, I think, has taken that money to subsidize other programs, right? Then have to go back into the public option. But there is an opportunity here to claim federal dollars to the extent that you can structure this in a way to save some cash. Um, so, so, go ahead. Yes. Go ahead. Are you, I just wondering if you were finished with that slide because no, I just I want to move on. It. Okay, so just a comment that um, I think it was uh, pretty unanimous in the part of the task force that provider reductions was not something we wanted to pursue. We, we've been trying to improve uh, equity of yeah. uh, payment for our providers. So just uh, a comment on that uh, from the task force perspective. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, um, and we can move on to the next slide, I think center lines that gets to your opening point, like, right, what is the thing then that you can do? What are we as a committee, how do you, how do you want to legislate or direct or kind of advance this policy conversation? And I think what we had recommended, and I think what would be, what could be a next step, I think it's probably a bridge too far at this point to say you're going to legislate and sort of say you're going to do a public option. That's probably a little too aggressive off the bat, but I do think uh, there's a bunch of implementation considerations that it is worth doing some more work about, right? And so the financing considerations around um, provider rates is one of them, right? If there's a, if there's definitely a, not an appetite, appropriately so, to to sort of threaten access any greater in the state of Vermont, you know, what are the considerations here? So, the implementation considerations I'm going to talk about now kind of come in the context of perhaps asking the state whether it's GBMC or the the Medicaid agency or the health um, department to go out and do some more work. Um, particularly actuarial work, right, that we can't provide here to really think through the implications of how this would work and whether or not it's an option for the state um, that could advance this access and affordability issue. So obviously the questions as we've talked about that you'd want to think about is what type, right, public-private partnership we've talked about, like Washington and Nevada have done, or a public program by and state-run plan. Um, I think mean, we've talked about that. Another consideration is benefit design. Right, obviously, um, or maybe it's not obvious, but I, I think it it would have to be a plan that would meet the requirements of a QHP in order to sort of generate savings or be able to say you generate savings because it's got to be a comparable plan. Tim, well, the, yes, sir. Tim um, uh, and Senator Lyons, um, would it be helpful just to 
um, for Tim to talk briefly about the interaction between the exchange and QHP and so and and this concept. Right. Okay. Yes. yes why so, don't we do that? But I, I don't want to lose sight of the time. So. Right. Yeah. So um, this would be the. So in order to claim savings, right, the third, to, to go to the federal government and say you want to get some of these savings back to the extent that we can calculate savings, the public option would otherwise need to be a comparable um, benefit, a QHB type benefit that you, than what you'd get on the exchange, right? You couldn't offer, for example, a limited benefit or hospital only or long-term care only. It would have to be a benefit that beneficiaries otherwise could get on the exchange through subsidy. So that's why it's important um, that the benefit design kind of match, what, at least start with a QHP so that then you can then say you've got a comparable plan that you're going to go back to the federal government and claim these savings. Um, but the other benefit that you get when you think about benefit design, the other lever that you get to tweak, and I think this gets to some of the questions um, that Senator Hardy was asking earlier, was you can, you can roll in or analyze whether you want to create um, network requirements or cost sharing requirements that might address other disparities or economic or racial or other access issues that are occurring in a state by putting requirements on the plan or adding benefits so, that might so just to just just to emphasize again i mean this then goes back to the comments i was making earlier around transparency contract transparency openness right. of rates and claims data that we don't have access to today right yeah okay but it has huge implications for access and affordability right so, right, so, so, in, so I think you can see here that it, it's more than just kind of benchmarking it to QHPs. There's an opportunity here to sort of say, you want to build into the benefit design some outcomes that are, you know, priorities for you all in terms of disparities, access, and quality. Um, next slide. So, uh, Tim, can I, can I just jump into here just for one second? Um, and just, I wanted to point out who this helps. Um, again, uh, we have before, and I, I don't wanna spend a lot of time on it, but I just wanna point out that we are talking about the small group, small employers mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and individuals um, that have seen those rate increases go up, right? Aggressively in that, in that market and, and in what might be called a death spiral to that market by some, right? And so the, the issue here is, is when you think of these different um, options. This one is targeted at that group of folks that is is not represented in any of the other options. Well, the cost growth target everyone's represented in, but this this is targeted at targeted at reducing the costs in that area specifically. Um, so I just wanted to say that one more time. Yep. And, and could I ask what happens to people who aren't associated with these small groups? I mean, individuals who are looking for health they can they'd be this would be um a, an offering on the marketplace they could enroll just like they could anything else on the marketplace so this would be an option for them okay thank you yep um so more implementation considerations we've talked about the um premium savings um and financing right how do you get there and i think it's pretty clear that rate reductions are not something that the committee wants to pursue. And we talked about the 1332 waiver. I, I think it's also important um, if you do further study and to think about is the impact of the ARPA premium subsidy, right? So there's an extension or uh, an increase under the various covered relief bills of, of the premium subsidies and the, the amount of premium subsidies, which are ex uh, expected to expire. I think understanding what that expiration is gonna do to the market and how that's gonna look uh, is gonna be important consideration. And then as uh, Joshua said, the impact on small employers uh, and what this might do for them. And then finally, right, tying this back to best point on um, the broader scheme of growth limitations and cost rate, kind of how does that all play together? Um, next slide. Um, and then finally, in terms of just implementation considerations, right, being very precise and understanding the impacts on the resident eligibility and marketplace. You have this, obviously, for the time being, have a, a 
combined small and individual group market. Um, that would be something you'd want to think about. Um, it's a fairly stable market. There's only two issuers. It's kind of understanding how that all plays to kind of how a public option would be put together. Um, who, who, and then another consideration would be kind of who, and we've talked about this in terms of some of the other options we've talked about today, right? Who in the state would be best position to, to oversee and run uh, a public option, right? Whether it's GB, the, the health board or the, um, the state insurance agency, kind of how that all plays together. Um, and then executing agency here and timing really are to speaking to who you would want to do this further analysis, not so much how you would implement it, but kind of who would you want to direct to, to go off and think for another six or eight months in more detail about a public option, right? Whether it's Vermont Health Access or not, I think the point is it's got to be coordinated amongst the Vermont Health Access, Green Mountain Health Board, and the Department of Financial Regulation because they all have a play uh, into the and, into insurance regulation uh, overall. And, and I would just point out here something that you will hear and have heard, which is that the departments are heavily stretched and every every new thing is, is an issue. And I don't want to gloss over that, um, but to the extent that there are one-time funds available to support the analysis here, there is, and I think you'll hear this um, from uh, the, the department and the agency, um, that the, their appetite for doing this might be timed uh, to coincide with the expiration of, of the subsidies on the, on the exchange or the reduction uh, uh, in the subsidy levels on the exchange, uh, because there will be a greater need then. Um, there, I would say there's a significant need today, um, uh, but, there, but the need will be greater then. Um, and so as you weigh out things, those are, there's some timing and issues there. Can you remind us of when the, the drop dead time is are for the uh, subsidies? I want to say they go through the end of 2024, but I will double check. Okay, so I, that, I, I think I thought that as well. But so if you look at your last timing issue there, there's some coordination. Yeah. So when one ends, the other yeah. mm -hmm. gets teed up. Right. Okay. Thank and not you. to make it too complicated, but um, it's healthcare, <laughs> so I'll make it a little more complicated, right? With all the unwinding that's going to occur on Medicaid eligibility and maintenance of effort, there's just going to be a lot of excitement in the market uh, for, for this kind of set of folks over the next 18 to 24 months. Okay, thank you. Senator uh, Hardy, go ahead. Go ahead. Just a quick question on the timing. I definitely understand the the timing related to those ARPA subsidies, which is something that my other committee, Senator Cummings and I talked about a lot in finance last year, um, because we're, I think we split out those markets temporarily. They're not combined. Um, and, not combined. Um, but is there also timing pressure or coordination desire with our waiver extension? I know that our, our overall global commitment waiver we asked, I believe, for a one-year extension because of the pandemic, and then it's going to come up again. So is there urgency to do this now? I, or I don't do see. It later? Right. I don't see, and Joshua should stop me if he thinks differently because he's closer at the state. This would kind of be on a different track than the global commitment to health waiver, right? This is not... <laughs> a Medicaid only um, problem or issue that's being addressed, I think, and it's a, quite frankly, it's a different set of folks at CMS that are gonna deal with it. Clearly there's an interaction there and, and we need to think about it, but I don't think one informs the other in terms of timing. Okay, that's actually good to know because if yeah. there was some urgency with that, that it would be a little bit more short right. on time. Right. Yeah, I think it's actually a different waiver, the all payer waiver um, and the interaction with with um, how we think about rate setting timelines for the small group market, um, which is those. So I think it, it, it's not a diva uh, global waiver. It's, it's the other waiver. Um, and I don't think, again, though, that it um, 
uh, necessarily has to move concurrently with that waiver. There are just um, some interplays from a regulatory perspective with how we regulate insurers and where this would be placed and timed um, to consider. Um, I don't believe that um, if there were something that needed to be changed in the all payer waiver, um, uh, that waiver is more urgent than at this moment, I think, because that's the place where that regulatory stuff is happening. Okay. So, you know, I you know, think when it's... there's so many waivers, one starts to wonder, you know, should we just <laughs> not have the system we have if everything we're doing is waiving what the requirements of our current system are? Just a thought. I, well, I will <laughs> say as a former yes. Fed, technically they are not waivers. They are demonstration <laughs> programs. projects. <laughs> True, that is true, but we all call them waivers. And I we know. All, well, maybe I, not you, but we all mix them up, and then Nolan has to tell us, no, no, it's this waiver, yeah. and it just becomes like this ridiculous thing of we're always asking to change the rules in but, order. You to know, you, as we're as we're looking at this, it comes to mind that it would be helpful for us to understand what the thirteen thirty two waiver is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we'll we I've put that down for an agenda item, okay. and uh, Tim, I don't know, maybe perhaps when you're back at some point, uh, you and Nolan can guide us through what that waiver is and who's responsible for it and how yep. what what has to happen to Happy do now. the things. Yeah, that'd be yep. great. Okay. So I think that's the end on public option. Okay, well, it's not I the end, of, like it's I, not I, the end without, of complexity. <laughs> right, without feeling too cheeky, I need to ask Senator Hardy if she liked this one, because she was rating the other two. <laughs> this one, uh, I, I do like this one, but I, I also understand that that the, it may be an uphill battle, at least for right. now. I think Josh's point about the overstretched state agencies is a really good one. But I feel like we could maybe get the ball rolling in some yep. way. <clears throat> so we'll see what happens, Senator. Good suggestion. Yeah, at the end, I can <laughs> give you a, you know, a, on a 10 point scale just yes. for feedback purposes. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, let's, uh, let's, let's expand our horizons. Okay, one more. Um, <laughs> so we'll, try and keep this the, to our last 15 minutes here. Um, so I, I think this one um, at the end makes sense. I think it's um, perhaps the most well-known of any of the options. It's been around a long time. It's highly successful um, from a, a national perspective. It's been lauded. Um, our community health teams, I think everybody's had some constituent who's had some uh, uh, interaction with the community health team at some point. Um, the key, key components to this are, again, it's an, ex it's an existing uh, program in Vermont. Um, it uh, is funded today, um, uh, you know, and it supports community health teams. It's funded so by our commercial insurers today, by Medicaid today, by Medicare today. Um, and uh, it's funded uh, on a community health team basis. So you pay your share um, as a payer. You pay your share based on an attribution method um, for the employees, and you don't pay based on units of service. Um, how many of your how many of your uh, insureds actually use the community health team? You pay based on the primary care medical home. How many of their um, uh, patients are your insureds. That's the basic model. Um, we can get into a lot of detail on how that attribution happens, um, uh, timing wise and all of that, but it, that, that doesn't matter too much. Um, it matters to Blue Cross or to <laughs> MVP or to Medicaid on a monthly basis, but it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter um, for this conversation. What matters is that we're attributing uh, lives um, based on their primary care medical home and getting a payment for those community health teams today to support those individuals who need support from a community health team. How do they get to that community health team? They get there by, exclusively by referral today. So the primary medical home says, hey, Josh needs some help uh, coordinating care, needs some help 
with their substance use, um, needs uh, behavioral health um, support that they're not getting um, from me or that needs to be better coordinated. And the community health team st steps in and um, provides um, supports either in helping folks get from one place to another uh, to find uh, the right uh, providers for them or to actually provide some um, services on an interventional basis. Um, and we have allowed in Vermont that, that blueprint for health to grow at the local level the way it needs to. So the teams are not identical um, and they're based on what the local uh, providers believe they need support from a community-based team to do. Um, and it's been very successful on that front because it meets the communities and the individuals where they are and provides um, supports for them how they need it, right? So really care focused. Um, and so much so that um, we believe that we could expand this um, offering in Vermont by doing some identification and stratification of the population to, I, to make sure that we don't solely do referral, but allow individuals to be identified and offered services um, uh, through the community health teams uh, that are identified as needing those supports. So currently, all the big payers um, and providers, UVM, Dartmouth, uh, Blue Cross, MVP, Medicaid, have programs where they do this, where they identify individuals who are high utilization, um, who are, uh, you know, utilizing uh, services, say, in the emergency room much more often than, than is normal. And they outreach and they say, you know, can we help you? Here's the, all kinds of supports we have for you. Um, the community health teams don't do that today. The Blueprint doesn't do that today. Um, but we're paying for that as a state um, in our commercial rates. Um, VCCI, um, the Vermont Chronic Care Initiative, is doing it today. You're paying for that explicitly by appropriation. Um, in addition, as rate payers, we're paying for the community health teams. Um, and um, so this, this would say, hey, we have a very successful community um, resource. One last piece on this. The the ERISA payers are not participating in the community health teams today um, because that no one's, they're not required to, and we haven't demonstrated the value to them explicitly for participating. So um, adding some identification and stratification to, to who could be enrolled or outreached by the Blueprint and expanding the Blueprint teams to meet those needs um, and following up with uh, how these needs have been met, so improved outcomes, improved consumer satisfaction, and um, reduced use of the ER, for, as, a, as just an easy example, um, for those teams would allow us to, to demonstrate to Blue Cross, um, to um, MVP, to UVM, uh, to Medicaid and Medicare, that our Blueprint teams are actually uh, more effective um, than some of the other interventions that may be happening in the system and would allow for the community health teams to do the thing they do really well, which is they're fully embedded and engaged at the community level. So that's the whole, that's the whole spiel on that at a high level about why uh, we believe there should be um, some additional expansion of the blueprint um, explicitly tied to identification of individuals um, using another pattern on top of the referral-based um, uh, pattern that's there today. Um, so um, that would allow, um, that would not just encourage, it would explicitly put in place um, the process necessary to demonstrate the success of the program empirically. So um, next slide and any questions as I, before I keep talking. I'm, I'm looking at the number of slides that we have. So it's probably good for you to keep going um, so we can get to uh, a place where we can have a, a additional questions and conversation. 
Sure, sure. And as I often do, I talk through this slide on the first slide without moving it. So um, this has some of the, the details around the dollars that we spend on those community health teams today. In your report, there's a full appendix with the, with the 2020 um, uh, spending on the blueprint uh, overall. Um, and you'll, you'll see that in your budget materials when the state comes in as well. Next slide. I, I think you probably we probably should emphasize the significance of uh, primary care practices within the uh, the concept of medical home or or uh, healthcare te community health care teams. Yeah, they're they're integral and embedded and have been part of since the beginning the development of the community health teams and and continue um, to. Uh, uh, have the primary role in in identifying what their needs are and the community health team, um, how the community health team can be integrated with the practices and utilized. So totally true. This is a this is a care management first. This is a clinical improvement first. Um, and it was actually started um, at the very beginning um, to uh, help uh, those primary care medical homes, uh, move forward on their accreditation status and improve their HEDIS scores and, and those things. Um, so uh, it really is a clinical first uh, an, uh, program. Um, next slide. So I, th I think what we want to point out here is that there, um, there have been some analyses done that demonstrate what really is um, powerful in improving outcomes for individuals um, and where we have demonstrated success. And important to that demonstrated success um, uh, are a few things. Um, one, that, that you're addressing behavioral health. Um, two, that you're including telehealth and information technology as part of um, your strategy. Um, and that from an organizational characteristic perspective that we have prior experience. So the blueprint has that. Um, we target patients with substantial non-medical needs in addition to medical problems. How much we do that um, is an unknown at this point and could be part of and, and should be part of um, uh, you know, identification and stratification. And the, the, the vendor that we brought in actually does that. So mine that we showed at the December 15th meeting actually does that, pulls in those um, non-medical um, issues um, very robustly um, and combines them with clinical data. Um, and that it's focused on individual patient care rather than transforming provider practice. So it's important to transform provider practice, right? Practices don't change how they do stuff. You can't change what the outcomes from the practices are. Um, but the, in order to, to have an intervention that uh, is successful uh, clinically um, and for the individuals in their outcomes um, across social and uh, medical outcomes, it really has to be focused on measuring the individual patient care. Um, and then using non-clinical staff um, uh, to provide. So the blueprint does some of these and, and not, not all of these. And the ones where we've, um, we're suggesting here, we would add to the blueprint would be that identification and stratification um, and that uh, uh, so that individuals are assigned to the blueprint um, for outreach uh, in a pathway other than just for referral through referral and that uh, measuring those outcomes would also then allow for the case to be made to the uh, ERISA em employers in the state and particularly to Cigna, for example, as their ASO, um, their administrative services organization, or sometimes it's called a TPA, uh, a third party administrator, um, uh, that they should participate in funding those community health teams explicitly because, hey, we enrolled um, two dozen of your folks, and, and they had these outcome improvements as a result of it. Um, and so uh, I think demonstrating that explicitly would be, would be very helpful to the cause. Um, next slide. Uh, can I just ask if of the um, 
on that previous slide, you said that of the 23 program features examined, seven were associated with favorable estimate costs and quality impact. Um, do you have a list of those that were not? Yes, I don't have it on this slide, but yeah, we can get that to you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. Sure. Lorraine, back down now. Yeah, I think we can move. We don't have to spend time on Maryland today. We can come back and talk about other states if folks are interested. So I think we have Maryland, Washington. Um, I, yeah, I think we can skip those and go right here to the... Um, So we can come back to the other states. Um, just briefly on CPC, I recognize we're at the very end of our time here today together. So um, what we wanted to point out here is that um, the innovations um, and the practice transformation delivery functions, so the bullets at the bottom of the page here, um, do help us to compare to our existing blueprint what's being done and perhaps um, what could what could be added or um, included that isn't um, being done today. And that health information technology vendor support, I would point out, um, not available today um, to the blueprint robustly or to our other initiatives robustly. It's a spotty um, and has been increased and decreased over time. Our actionable feedback reports, again, um, not standardized. Our definition of care management, not standardized across um, the state for all the different care management, case management, and care coordination activities. Um, um, not known today um, how many folks are enrolled in, say, a UVM, four different UVM care management pro programs, and how many of those same individuals are enrolled in the community health team or in a Blue Cross Blue Shield or MVP uh, intervention. And so the ability to um, put those things together um, uh, and to uh, keep track of who's doing care management for whom, when, um, uh, is something that uh, would benefit the Blueprint and all of our other care and case management programs. And that can be done and is part of our um, are um, how you do comprehensiveness and, and planned care and population health um, at a statewide level. Um, we know how to do it, in fact. Um, uh, we, again, not, not the people on this phone, uh, necessarily not myself um, doing this, um, you know, but that there are population health, uh, we know how to do it from a population health perspective. And with that, um, I'm gonna recognize that it's 11 o'clock. Um, and I'm happy you know, to uh, and talk more. Uh, Joshua, right. We're, uh, our committee actually goes another 15 minutes today. And so I, the, the, the hard stop at 11 was so that we could have an opportunity for further discussion and questions if you're still available. Um, I can I can be on for, uh, okay. for the next 15 minutes. I believe we lose Beth right, at, right now, though. OK. Um, oh, any quick questions yeah, for I'm Beth? I'm sorry about that. Okay, well, so so Beth, I think you've heard the questions regarding the um, cost growth containment uh, piece and um, trying to see the value of that to improved patient quality. I think that's one yep. that we all have, but we also did talk about collecting claims information and claims database and utilizing that for clinical improvements. So maybe at some point we could get a more, you know, a more robust discussion about that going forward because I think we're, our our goal here is access that is quality based and affordability that yeah. is downward trend okay yeah, I, I'll say two things before I leave um, one is that you know the, the cost growth should be seen as sort of an um, umbrella um, strategy um, that helps support or, uh, you know, an overall target. It is not supposed to answer all of the questions. That doesn't mean that there aren't pieces of it that can help um, to improve quality and that you can't include as part of 
um, the overall um, strategy uh, additional uh, initiatives that would do that. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is I checked on the number of um, Vermonters that were in self-insured plans, and those are the ones that are not in the VCURES um, system, and it looks to be about 20%. So 20% of the total, 20% of the total. But I think what's important is that it sort of sets the tone um, to have everybody in and to have um, have the cost growth benchmark be something that um, is applicable across the state um, and regardless of um, what the insurance is and that there's transparency and um, publicity really um, about what, um, how um, insurer rates are growing um, or not growing. All right, thank you. All right, so I'm sorry that I have to run, but um, but I know uh, Josh and uh, Tim can answer any other questions while I'm gone. Thank you so. very much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good uh, day. You too. I do have one question for Joshua before we... Um, change course here on the blueprint and that the predicted number of people who would be affected through the identification process? Um, so uh, we do, um, Lorraine, I don't know if the not that number's on one of these slides. Um, I, so. I just don't remember. Um, it, is, it, it is in the report um, yeah. that we could impact up to 65,000 individuals. Um, uh, and we don't know today how many individuals are rolling through the blueprint um, on a monthly or annual basis. Um, it's nowhere near that number. Um, uh, that 65,000 number is taken from uh, some national studies that have been done on the uh, percent of a, of a population um, that at any point in time could benefit from some level of care or case management or care coordination. I'll say that that's a gross number, right? Like it's, it's, um, it's um, certainly um, overstated at any, like um, we wouldn't enroll that many people, right? Um, so how many would be enrolled is somewhere, is something that we would um, limit here in the same way that we would for the moderate needs group based on what the resources are available, right? Um, and uh, today, uh, so that, that that's what I can say about that. Yeah, well, and if uh, since ERISA is not included in that, then we're seeing that ERISA is 20% of the total. And if ERISA did begin to cover, uh, you utilize a blueprint, that that would be a, a significant number. So those are the kinds of things that we would like to understand. And then mm -hmm. obviously the return on investment is so critical here and what value the blueprint ha brings or has brought and continues to bring. So those are kinds of things we need to look at. But um, in terms of moving forward, there are some very discreet things that you've identified. So, uh, Senator Hardy. Thanks, I'm just gonna get out ahead of Tim's question and say that this one seems super vague to me. Um, and so it's it's hard for me to tell what this would do. I don't think you make the case very clearly. <laughs> um, and, and the sort of trying to sell it to ERISA plans is kind of a chicken and egg thing because it's pretty hard to sell it to them if they're not part of it. Um, and a lot of those ERISA plans have similar programs built in uh -huh. that are sort of behavioral health and care management things that they offer to their their participants. I know that based on my own experience as being in an ERISA program. So I think it might be really hard to prove to them that getting rid of what they're already doing and doing the blueprint and paying for the blueprint instead is going to be better for them. Um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I think in general, the blueprint is one of those things that is a is a good thing, but it's really hard to explain to people what it is and how it's helping. Um, yep. And so I think needing to be able to be more explicit about that. And and even still, I'm I'm still it seems very vague, this proposal. Yep. Yeah, so yeah. I, let me share some the 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 concern that I've always had about blueprint. I, I was 
I was part of the whole development process and legislatively with that and feel that it's such a critical part of our healthcare. But for me, it's a model. It's a model for care delivery. Uh, it, you know, rather than paying into, it's not an insurance, it's not insurance necessarily, but it's a model for how care is delivered. And the question that we would have is, uh, what are we improving the quality of care for patients through this and making things less stressful when they move from a care service to care service or from medical care to behavioral or other care? And are there cost savings when patients are treated utilizing this model? So that's the kind of thing I think needs to be demonstrated when uh, any insurer is going to um, put invest in uh, um, this care model for their consumers. We use the word, I'm using the word consumers for insured, so. So, yeah, and, and Senator Lyons, thank you for that uh, reminder. Um, the, the program that we are um, proposing, this is an enhancement, right, to an existing. So um, I, I um, can take a one minute stab at being more, more precise. Um, and that is that the current program is by referral only and payment is made using a different mechanism, um, which pays for the teams, but doesn't connect payment for the teams with savings to the insurer, employer, um, individual, um, and doesn't connect outcomes directly to those HEDIS measures that the insurer in particular would be very um, happy to have better HEDIS outcomes. And so in doing those things, this goes back to that sort of that statewide pop health uh, identifying individuals who need help and following up with the return on investment analysis, which would include both the, the clinical outcome improvements, those HEDIS metrics um, that have a dollar value to insurers. Um, so they can put a dollar value on, on what a good HEDIS measure means to them. Um, and um, where there is uh, an improvement in health outcomes that reduces medical utilization for individuals um, or increases less expensive utilization and decreases more expensive utilization. To the extent that we can, um, as part of the blueprint, build in the modeling for, for that, both for identifying people who are more likely to have a beneficial outcome and then measuring what those outcomes are, we can do uh, several things. We can get CMS, Medicare, and Medicaid to continue to pay and to increase their investments in paying for those community health teams based on demonstrating that. And we can make the case to, as part of a rate setting process with our insurers that we do set rates for, that we can include a, an additional amount downward based on, uh, on their rates, based on having individuals enrolled at a higher level in the community health teams. And third, we can make the case to the ERISA employers that they, th here's the benefit, like we'll show it to you in, in number of people and in dollars and cents. Um, and in and in health outcomes. That's the idea. Probably, I hope it's not still clear as mud. If it's still clear as mud, we can come back to it. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we'll be back to it. And I'm sure we're gonna hear a lot of comments from uh, other folks who are very interested in, mm -hmm. uh, there are a number of folks who are interested in this expansion, but there are folks who are interested in other areas. I guess as I look at some of the options that are before us, um, I, I want to think about touching as many Vermonters as we can with uh, reduced out of pocket and reduced uh, costs so that they and increased access. So when whatever decisions we make, looking at affecting as many people as we can, and ensuring then that we're keeping money in their pockets, if even if, if we had a, 
if we said we want the umbrella, you know, we want to hold down costs, whether hospitals or others, we want to make sure that when we're holding those costs down, that we're putting, we're keeping the money in Vermonters' pockets. We're not having them pay for that reduction somehow. So um, there so is a lot here. Senator Lyons, to your point, just that I forgot to make this point, which is that the Vermonters who access community health teams, there's no cost for Vermonters who access um, those community health teams. Right. That's important. Which is why the greater the emphasis we can place, I think, initially on primary care and then uh, having that primary care be accessible, um, then would allow for greater access to those behavioral and other uh, need, social service needs for folks. Oh, okay. Committee questions? I, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think we can make decisions now to throw out or keep in any one or more of these. I know that some f f sound more appealing and uh, simply because we're more familiar with them and that's okay. You know, the, 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 the moderate needs piece I think resonates with everyone, but then some of the other pieces I think will begin to resonate um, as we look at combating um, opioid uh, addiction or substance use disorders and making sure that folks are getting the type of care that they need. Comments, questions? Well, um, Madam Chair, first of all, can we take the slides down so we can see each other more? Well, there's a thought. Um, That's a good one. That's a good thought. <laughs> Thank Second you, all, Senator. <laughs> sure. I, I, I just want to um, thank everybody for the the presentation today it was much clearer than the other day um and uh there's a lot to think about um and i also am going to uh leave early today because i need to sort of get in my headspace to report a bill on the floor so yes uh, and so senator we're, we're going to finish in about a minute i wanted to give everyone extra time and especially you and wish you good luck and and well on your floor report Thank you. So I will see everyone again, I'm sure. Thanks, Josh. Yes, you will. And Lorraine and Beth. Beth, who left. Okay. okay. Bye, everyone. See you on the floor. All right. So, um, uh, committee quest questions Senator Hooker, Senator Cummings, Se Senator Carby, <laughs> Ledge Council Carby. Sorry. You want me to start? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, thank you. Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. This is just a, a brief um, clarification. I had wanted to check in with DIVA folks to confirm, but the, the increased advanced premium tax credits from ARPA are only in effect through 2022. There is a proposal in the federal Build Back Better bill that would, incre would in uh, extend them through 2025, but that has not been enacted yet. So just so that we're all operating under the same information. What do you know is the, is the, oh, the 2025 is in the Build Back Better that's sitting there on the wall? Okay. In, in whatever form of sitting on the wall they do, yes. Boy, okay. Um, I'm not sure I wanna say thank you for that, but thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Senator Hooker, Senator Cummings, Senator Terenzini, you've been soaking it in. Any thoughts or questions? Too much. To, to, to. There will be questions. Yeah. <laughs> right good. Now. No, that's good. You know, and uh, this is a Friday. Uh, Any time that you have during the cold weather over the weekend to take a gander at the report itself or at the information you've received today and bring uh, questions in or the things that you think would be helpful taking next steps. So are there things legislatively that you think we might do to move forward in any one or more of these areas would be very helpful. We're gonna have to narrow ourselves, no question, but uh, there are some things I think we can do. There are bills that we have in committee that could serve as vehicles. Um, I'm thinking we should use an S bill. I'm not interested in tacking things onto an H bill at this point, unless you, unless uh, not yet. we get desperate. So. Okay. 
Joshua and, and, and Tim and Lorraine and Beth, who's not here, I greatly appreciate your time and clarification. We will come back to this. We will have you folks in um, as we go forward. We'll start talking amongst ourselves and then looking to see how we wanna move forward. And then we're going to need uh, additional support uh, as we do that. So thank you. Yeah, we'll be around. Um, easily reachable um, and happy to take it. Nolan, ha Nolan has your number. It sure does. So do That's you. <laughs> okay.